Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ifi Malo, and I'm the moderator for this session. And on this panel, we have the following: uh, Mr. Patrick Child, um, who's the director, deputy. We have Mr. Patrick Child, who's the deputy director um, at the European Commission. We also have Masamba Thioye, who is with the UNFCC, C, Triple C, sorry. And we have Brian B, who's with the SE for all. So welcome. If Thank you can you hear me, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Thank you. All right. All right, we'll dive right into it. And I'm going to start off with you, Mr. Child. Um, you know, we, we're trying to ensure a successful energy transition with uh, public and private sector initiatives. Um, and one of the things that we wanna know is what the greatest barriers to the implementation of the UN and EU's most ambitious frameworks are, and whether there are any silver bullets to sort of overcome them. Well, thanks very much. I'm very happy to be here and, uh, and, and great to be part of this uh, discussion. I've been looking forward to it. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, the answer to your question is there are no real silver bullets. Unfortunately, if we had silver bullets, we would already been using them. Uh, but uh, I think that as far as the European Commission and the European Union are concerned, I mean, we have set ourselves with the European Green Deal, this sort of headline objective set by our president, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the objective of becoming the first uh, carbon neutral uh, continent by 2050. And of course, for that to happen, uh, we need above all uh, a major transformation in the uh, energy system. And for that to happen, we need a uh, major investment, firstly, in research and innovation to identify the solutions to ensure that we have the technologies for clean and affordable energy for all. Um, and then we need the uh, even greater investment for the deployment uh, and implementation of the, of the solutions that our research and innovation programs will uh, produce. So in Europe, I mean, we are in a, the, the beginning of a new budget cycle. Um, we're about to launch what we call our next uh, multi-annual financial framework with an overall budget for the European Union, including uh, uh, some significant extra resources for um, uh, the post-COVID recovery um, of something approaching 2 trillion euros over the next um, seven years or so. And I think what the real challenge for us is to find innovative ways of uh, leveraging this enormous uh, financial mass in order to support um, our political goals on the European Green Deal and on the um, uh, digital transition, uh, while ensuring a, a recovery process from the COVID recovery, which is um, uh, resilient uh, and forward-looking. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That's very interesting to hear. But when we're looking at, at the post-COVID recovery that you mentioned, um, what kind of innovations are you seeing that is coming on board to sort of address energy access? Um, and which ones are you seeing across the EC? Well, I mean, uh, of course, we are at the beginning of making our plans for the post-COVID recovery. Um, and we are determined to, uh, to use the resources that we have, the investment instruments, the budget resources, um, and our policy framework in a way which ensures that the uh, big post-COVID recovery investments are as much as possible focused on um, things which are consistent with the with the European Green Deal, the green transition, and which will also help to accelerate uh, the digitalization of our economies. So investments in the future, not just sort of short-term economic uh, uh, stimulus. And I think that that is the way that um, we are discussing with our, our member states in the European Union. And it's, I think, something which we're also uh, you know, projecting as an approach which we think should be followed at the global level as well. Um, but more specifically, I think that uh, some of the areas that we've been looking at are, are um, developing the hydrogen economy. The European Commission uh, presented a new um, strategy for hydrogen during the summer of this year. Uh, we're looking at the whole question of heating and cooling of buildings and, and sort of overhauling the way that we use energy in the built environment, particularly in our 
in our cities. Um, we've got a very strong emphasis, of course, still on renewable energy um, uh, with, with uh, offshore uh, renewables, uh, mostly wind, but also to some extent solar. Um, you know, these are some of the things that we hope that we will be able to invest in um, uh, and, and where we will make a big contribution in terms of research and innovation to empower the uh, the business community to go further and above all to bring down the costs so that uh, clean energy solutions are uh, genuinely um, sort of commercially attractive by comparison with the traditional uh, fuel based uh, fossil fuel based uh, alternatives. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to go to Masamba right now. Um, Masamba, you, you work for the UNCCC, um, mm -hmm. and the UN being the global uh, pan-global body um, mm -hmm. that everybody looks up to, especially in a time of crisis. I guess my question for you is, how do we as a global community fighting climate change, dealing with a COVID pandemic, a global pandemic, and then dealing with some opposition voices and opinion, how do we marry those three things um, from your perspective? Um, thank you. Uh, from my side, I'm also very pleased to be part of this panel discussing this very important issue. One of the things that definitely is needed is to be able to display disruptive leadership and complement the narrative of a problem approach that is the current narrative with a narrative of a solution approach. Uh, sustainability introduce disruptive issue that require disruptive solution, including leaders able to turn the challenge into opportunity. So this is very important to be able to have a such type of, of leaders leaders that are um, strategic thinker and can decrypt for the energy sector the sustainability signal, understand the associated risk and opportunity, and identify the level to act on to mitigate the risk, but also leverage the opportunities. We need also uh, leaders that are able to zoom in and out to see the bigger picture that can identify and bring out the interaction across issue and, and region and use integrated and inclusive approach to address for the energy sector the four dimensions of sustainability, which are ecologic, sociopolitic, economic, and, and, and cultural. So we need also to have proactive and responsible leaders committed to the creation of global public good and that can act to achieve longer term benefit for future generation. So these inspirational leaders will be able to mobilize all parties, corporate, financial, clean tech startup that are expected to provide the required exponential solution, as well as individual citizen, including the sceptical one, and make them act to implement Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. So we believe in the emergence of such type of leaders and this group give hope that the sustainability, the sustainable energy challenge can be turned into opportunity. And uh, it will be an opportunity for a sustainable world with a safe climate and prosperity uh, for all. We do not hear you. You're on mute. Huh? Sorry about that. Um, I guess my, my follow-up question to you, because I see that you have an emphasis on leadership, and I think that's great because we do need you know um, leadership at this time, especially in a time of crisis. Is it, Do you have any examples of any case study where that is currently happening to help us get to this goal 2030 and where some of these innovations and some of these um, agendas are being sort of put in the forefront of driving those agendas. Yeah, I think one of the examples of uh, clear leadership I can provide is the change of uh, business model of a company like the Danish oil and 
natural gas, dong, that become earth state. This is really a very interesting, very interesting example that need to be widely shared because it demonstrate very high level of, of leadership. This is the example of an oil and gas company that has been turned into a wind company and that is now the number one company in offshore wind. They understood that the competence that are needed to build offshore platform are quite similar to the competence that are needed to have uh, to, to, to operate oil and gas um, in the, in, at, at the sea. And they did not hesitate to make the shift in business model. I think this is really a demonstration of great leadership. Thank you so much for that, Masamba. I'm going to move over very quickly to Brian. Brian, and you know that I'm going to ask you about heating and cooling. Um, and I'm, I like what Patrick said at the beginning about all of the innovation that is going on in, in, around the space. Um, this is a huge topic on the horizon for many countries as they're facing growing populations and the temperature changes due to you know, the global warming um, and climate change. Um, do you see a role for legislation and policy making in helping to address and accelerate this issue in any way? And are there countries that are in the forefront of leading that currently? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for the question and thanks for having me here. Uh, yeah, as um, head of energy efficiency and cooling here at SE for All, we actually have a program called Cooling for All. And um, in that, we, we, in tracking the data, we see that there are billions of people that are at risk. And in fact, over a billion people at the highest level of risk in, in countries due to lack of access to cooling. And uh, governments are starting to um, make commitments and, and uh, put plans in place. But uh, overall, what we see from SD for All is we see that, first of all, we need to look at where the needs are and what are the needs associated with access to cooling and how do we best deliver solutions. In some cases, uh, you know, as um, Masamba and Patrick have mentioned, some, some cases it's great technologies that need to be delivered to market. In some cases, it's better business models. And in fact, we're working on a solutions uh, toolkit that will help people understand which technology, which policies, uh, which uh, services, and which financial solutions are best. Um, these all need to make it into countries' national cooling action plans or national cooling strategies. Uh, countries like Rwanda and India and China were the first three countries that took a step forward and pulled together these strategy and, and action plan documents. There's much more that needs to be done um, across many countries and making sure that it's not just looking at how do we get an air conditioner in every home or how do we get a refrigerator in every home, but instead it's pushing it a level further. How do we actually reduce the need for heating? How do we mm -hmm. reduce the need for cooling? and um, making sure that we can use passive solutions, uh, things like better insulation or windows, um, trees and other nature-based solutions. Cities like Medellin in uh, Colombia has actually reduced their temperature in the city by having a nature-based solution. So I see that there's a need for um, innovation across the board, um, technology innovation, but also services and, and business model innovation. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that's that's a very interesting answer. And it's great to see that these three countries, Rwanda, India, and I think you said China, are uh, some of the countries that are putting these plans in place. Um, I guess another follow-up question to you on that score is, um, how integral is the architecture or the building um, ecosystem uh, involved in all of these plans? Because, you know, th th there's the school of thought that if they're not brought on board, then everything that we're trying to do is being done in futility. So how much of a part are we trying to create a larger ecosystem to bring, you know, aligned or even unaligned um, stakeholders into this conversation and into this mix? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. In fact, uh, coming out of the Climate Action Summit last year, um, the UN Climate Action Summit last September, 
uh, the there was a 3% club created, and this was focused on actually bringing together partners uh, so that these silos that do end up causing issues, some countries get siloed support from, from many partners. And the idea of the 3% club is to come together as a club and commit to actually achieving our goals, um, particularly on energy efficiency, but this applies to everything. And uh, when we talk about you know, building architecture versus the the, the cooling solutions. You know, th those are two silos you can say in in the, in the cooling and, and buildings uh, issues. And uh, we we certainly see that there's um, a need for uh, building uh, you know partnerships that uh, would deliver both um, more passive uh, buildings uh, and also delivering more efficient technologies to market while doing so and delivering the energy with more renewable technologies. So it's, you could say there's energy efficiency and renewables integration, there's um, passive, you could say sufficiency and efficiency integration. And uh, yeah, the 3% the club is I think one platform that's really trying to drive that forward to break down those silos. That's an interesting, I'm going to look up the 3% club once this is over. I'd never heard of it before. Yeah, um, it's and new I'm going, and, and coming up. <laughs> it's coming up, okay. I'm going to go back to Patrick very quickly. Um, you, you talked a lot about research, you talked a lot about innovation. I, I wonder if you can let us into any sort of work that the EC might be doing to help um, other national state governments um, to, engage in you know research and innovation in trying to meet our co2 reduction goals um and if there are any countries that are in the forefront of adopting these measures and i keep on harping on you know specific examples because people want to draw examples because that's where they draw inspirations from so if you can give us any specificity that would be great well i think the, the best example of how we are in the european union part of a sort of global community trying to uh, support innovation into clean energy solutions is through mission innovation this is this uh, network of uh, 25 or so uh, countries around the world which came together after the paris agreement uh, on climate change to uh, with a commitment to double their, their their publicly funded research and innovation into um, uh, clean energy uh, and and we've been then organizing that around a number of uh, different themes whether it's sort of uh, smart grids whether it's uh, renewables whether it's hydrogen you know different themes so that we can get a, a really active uh, global conversation going and in the in in the five years or so since the uh, launch of mission innovation it's been growing from strength to strength more members have joined and we're now starting a reflection which i hope will come to conclusions at the um cop meeting in glasgow uh, next year uh, on the next sort of generation of, of mission innovation and there are a couple of things which i think are very important the first is that we do need to broaden the conversation beyond the uh, the sort of 25 or so core members who are perhaps the most well resourced most committed in order to make sure that the innovation that we're developing can then feed into the energy policies of uh, developing countries and you know other countries around the world so a more inclusive approach is certainly one thing that we're sorry that we are going to be uh, pursuing for the next uh, round of mission innovation and the second is to try and have an even stronger focus on some of the top priorities in terms of um, uh, the themes that we want to work together on. So hydrogen stands out as something where many, many partners around the world want to work together. Um, I think we would like to see a conversation developing on what we can do in cities. And um, that comes back to what we've just been talking about in terms of uh, you know, the um, heating and cooling in buildings. And, and uh, But more broadly, how do cities operate as energy consumers, uh, whether it's for mobility, whether it's the way that people live and work, uh, as well as you know the, the more classical dimensions of the energy system. And so I think uh, giving strong support to the next sort of phase in the life of um, mission innovation as the sort of global capitalist for this international co co conversation around clean energy and innovation is the best example i could offer you that's that's very interesting and that's very helpful to know that there is a very inclusive approach to how they're, we're growing this ecosystem and at, um, addressing some of the issues that are coming up um, at both a global level but also at national levels and my next question goes to both masamba and brian um, 
and either of you can go first. Um, how can global access to renewable energy be guaranteed for all? You know, we have the goal 2030. We, you know, we've had several goals that have been set over time. Um, but also making it as inclusive as Patrick has alluded to, so that we're not leaving out communities, especially vulnerable communities, not just from these conversations, but also from the impact. Um, and what are those specific things that are going on to make sure that that doesn't happen? Asamba? Yeah, I think if we want uh, to have this global access to renewable energy materializing, we have to push at the supply side and pull from the demand side. At the supply side of renewable energy, we have to act on two levels. We have to support the development of a transformative renewable energy solution but also we have to support the massive deployment of renewable energy as it was uh, mentioned by by patrick at the beginning we have to work on these two level so policy supporting r d and vertical transfer of renewable energy solution are needed to read to further reduce their cost and enhance their efficiency and this include uh, putting in place venture capital fund targeting clean energy startup that could be seeded with public finance with a first slot position. So we need to have finance directed to um, clean tech startup that are working on, on new solution. We need also to enhance the horizontal transfer of the renewable energy solution from developed to developing uh, countries. So for the scaling up of the deployment, um, I will focus more on renewable electricity. Um, for the most vulnerable community to have enhanced access to renewable electricity, it must be available at affordable prices. Mm. This critically requires for renewable electricity projects in developing countries enhance access to low cost financing, lower transaction cost, and lower cost of equipment. So this can be facilitated by a combination of things. So for example, um, an harmonization at the regional level of legislation related to um, renewable energy project contract will help a lot because this can contribute in reducing the transaction cost. The standardization of contract and associated procurement contract for renewable electricity can also help. And then at the national level, the implementation of framework for the facilitation of investment in renewable electricity with relevant regulatory authority, national agency, or enhanced access to clean and modern energy sovereign fund for strategic investment in renewable electricity, national investment policies recognizing and incentivizing investment in renewable electricity. Uh, we need also a guarantee mechanism because one of the main problem, uh, let's say um, developing countries are facing to have further access um, to um, supply of renewable electricity is the lack of access to low cost financing. And this can be addressed with guarantee mechanisms that are expected to significantly reduce the cost of capital. Um, at the demand side of renewable energy, empowerment of uh, communities, uh, vulnerable communities and individual citizens so that they have access to and can benefit from the use of these renewable energy solution is something very important. For example, at the UNFCCC Secretariat side, one of the things that we are really pushing for is to have a framework that will allow to recognize the contribution of individual citizens using renewable energy solution and be able to incentivize at the individual level. So for example, 
if a woman in a rural area in Africa is using um, efficient cook stove for cooking, we need to be able to measure the impact, her contribution to addressing climate change and be able to incentivize such a type of uh, contribution. Now we are using the digital technology, we are leveraging digital technology to be able to do so. Back to you. So, yeah, I, I can add on a little bit uh, to Masamba's great, great point. Um, I think he was, he was quite comprehensive, but uh, from, from the SE SC for All perspective, obviously we see that electrification is really important both for um, the energy access story, but also transition. And so, um, populations and um, at, at SE for All, uh, we, we've created a, a new universal electrification facility, which is a results-based financing uh, uh, effort uh, that will be looking at those most vulnerable populations to actually increase access to energy um, through uh, electrification approaches. Uh, beyond that, you know, I would uh, frame it also that a lot of the technologies and a lot of the approaches, they're out there. And while innovation has, and uh, I think that there's a significant opportunity to um, make sure that these uh, solutions to the most vulnerable populations um, by using government-backed approaches, but also just making these business models uh, cost-effective. Sometimes it's bulk procurement. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, um, you know, just changing uh, the uh, business model approach itself. So I'd say, you know, that's my sort of addition to Masamba's point there, that electrification and uh, using innovative approaches that are already out there and spreading it uh, to other countries and deeper into the countries backed by government. Thank you very much, Brian. Do you want to add, did you want to add to that, Patrick? No, I mean, I think I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, we have a specific um, uh, partnership under our sort of overall agreement with the African Union with Africa of how we can share the technologies that we have been developing in the European Union, particularly in areas like renewables or um, uh, you know, other sort of um, clean technologies, and how we can then support the countries of the region uh, to develop and deploy them in the local context. And if that means also working on things like off-grid solutions and other approaches, I mean, I, I agree with uh, Brian absolutely that electrification is the key. Um, and also there's a very big dimension about um, uh, access to finance, as uh, Masamba has said, and that uh, uh, that that's something that that uh, the business model uh, also needs to help us because government funding, as we know, can only go a li very limited way towards the massive scale of investments that are needed. And so we, of course, have a uh, an opportunity, responsibility to use the, the the money that we have to sort of as seed capital or to kickstart what is happening at a larger level. Uh, but unless there is a sort of commercially viable solution out there. Um, then, then, you know, it's not going to happen. And that's so when it comes back to the importance of bringing the costs of these new technologies down to an affordable and, and competitive level. And that's also a space where innovation uh, and research can play an, a very important point. Because, you know, even if we know that in theory certain, you know, technologies might work, if they're just unaffordable, then, then they're not going to happen. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you so much, Patrick. Now, we're slowly coming to the close of this panel, but I have one last question, um, and that is asking you to be a bit of Nostradamus here. Um, a carbon neutral, a neutral future, um, 10 years from now, what's your prediction? How will the world you know, look 10 years from now in sort of attacking some of these issues that we've raised here? I'll start with you, Brian. <laughs> So I think I think ten years from now we we will see. I mean, a, a lot of these technologies and approaches they are on an S curve. They are um, exponentially increasing uh, at the moment, and they uh, ideally some of the big ones will um, reach the top of that S and, and reach market saturation. But we we've seen it with uh, um, LED lights. Um, we expect to see it um, with electric vehicles over time, and. Uh, I believe that some even historic traditional approaches like passive cooling, uh, you know, some of those measures 
could actually uh, in increase their, their market penetration significantly over the next 10 years. Will we be carbon neutral in 10 years? No, um, but I do believe uh, we'll have a, a number of the core uh, issues around uh, transport, uh, cooling, uh, and lighting well, well on their way. Thank you, Brian. Masamba? Yeah, I think I see the world shifting from uh, let's say uh, problem-based to solution-based and be able to build on opportunities. I would see also a strong focus on need-based approach. So uh, most of the debate that we are having now are focusing on, on means. And as it was mentioned, I think we need to go down to the services that is provided. We need to go down to the need that is to be satisfied so that we can find the optimal um, solution. So I think digital will play a very important role, the new emerging digital technology, uh, as well as the uh, development of um, global interconnected uh, grid, rational, big rational, rational grid, because the further development of renewable electricity will require uh, important grid at the national, at the regional level that covers uh, a, a, a broad range of, of, of countries. Um, I also um, expect to see much more um, um, progress being done on storage this is very important and on 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 hydrogen hydrogen and and um, all these things put together will be able to put the world on track to be climate neutral by 2050. what about you patrick well i think in 10 years time we'll know whether we are on track or we're not on track. I mean, or at the moment, we know we're not really on track, but we still think that if we do more um, and if we get you know, the global community pulling together in the, in the Glasgow COP, uh, that, that we still have a chance of, um, of turning things around. Uh, the European Union, as I've said, has set really ambitious target of full decarbonisation by 2050. We'd love to see the other major actors around the world uh, trying to beat our level of ambition, or if not, at least aligning themselves on it. And we'll see what happens, of course, in the coming weeks in, in the United States elections. And that will be, I think, very, very uh, determining in what's going to happen in the future. Um, but, in, but our intermediate target for 2030, which is 10 years' time, is a 55% reduction. Um, and we believe that if we're not at that sort of level of reduction by by 2030, then getting to full decarbonisation by 2050 is going to be really, really difficult. Um, so I really call on everyone watching this, and I think uh, you know the, the global community more generally, uh, to see the Glasgow COP as a real watershed, the moment when we, we um, are going to show ourselves collectively serious about the full decarbonisation um, uh, objective and therefore face up to the massive transitional challenges that that is going to apply for our societies and the way we live and our economies and the way we work together in the global community um, and of course the energy transition is going to be absolutely central to that how can we provide clean secure sustainable energy supplies for everyone um, in as part of this decarbonization agenda because without that um, it, it's not going to work thank you patrick I'm going to ask uh, uh, one very last question before I close down this panel. There's a, a growing um, school of thought that suggests that you know a lot of the work around uh, you know decarbonization, uh, carbon neutral future, is very Western based and doesn't really take into the developmental indices of a lot of you know sub-Saharan Africa or even you know vulnerable um, states and communities that haven't reached that level of development as the West has. Uh, this is a very political question. And you all work for um, you know, inter large international organizations that are probably having to deal and address with these issues. Um, I wondered if you have anything to say, because I know that we have people from our audience that are probably listening and wondering, well, how does this help me in my own little corner of the mm -hmm. earth if, we're, if what we're struggling with isn't exactly the same as what people in the West are struggling with? Patrick, I'll start with you. Well, I think Brian's going to have the best answer to this question because it's you know all about the mission of his organization. But but I mean I agree with the implied sort of proposition behind your question. 
unless we can carry the whole of the global community that's bringing um, the developed and the developing world together united around this common ambition we're not going to succeed and that does mean that we really have to go the extra mile when it comes to um, sharing our technologies providing the financial and other forms of support that we needed uh, to all the countries in the world and i think that the european union although i mean it's a sort of part of our broader um, external relations agenda rather than more specifically the responsibilities of research and innovation that i'm involved in is deeply committed to this agenda and as part of our overall commitment in particular to the sustainable uh, development goals um that, that this is something that we have to do as a planet and that we cannot afford to leave anyone behind and i think that's the key message i wanted to leave thank you for that what about you brian yeah so that's that's great uh we we, we certainly see it obviously it is um how Sustainable energy um, can really help all of the other development developmental goals that countries have. We we know that there are multiple benefits uh, associated with energy efficiency, with electrification, the health benefit, uh, the education benefit, the productivity, the jobs, uh, everything that we're looking for in uh, developing and emerging economies. Uh, they're they're powered by by energy. And actually, having sustainable energy there uh, delivers many more benefits than uh, traditional, uh, you know, carbon-emitting uh, sources. And um, you know, the most local jobs are, uh, you know, having power in your own town and your own village, and uh, doing energy efficiency and planting those trees. Those are local jobs, and uh, um, you know, create better environments for the children to learn and and people to. Uh, recover from uh, the current health uh, pandemic. So we we see that um, you know as is the the pin from SD for all, energy efficiency is at the core of achieving all of the sustainable development goals. Thank you, Brian. Masamba, we have just a minute before we round up. Yeah, I just would like to highlight that a vulnerable community are those that are the first to benefit from a sustainable development pathway because they depend on the ecosystem and ecosystems are very much exposed to the threat of, of climate change. But yes, uh, countries such as countries in Africa need to develop, that's clear, but definitely they need to develop differently. They should not use the pathway of developed nation. They should not first build a carbon intensive economy and then decarbonize. They have to leapfrog and directly move to a sustainable uh, economy with a sustainable energy system. Thank you, Masamba. Well, thank you, all of you. Thank you, Patrick, Frank, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Masamba. This has been such a great panel. I've really learned a lot and uh, enjoyed the conversations that we've had today. Uh, some of the key takeaways for me is that we have to dedicate a lot more investment into research and innovation. Um, we have to look at how to build um, a transformative economy um, and looking at business models and, and looking at approaches and plans that exist um, or that we need to improve upon um, and what kind of uh, guarantee mechanisms that we can put in place to make sure that countries are not being left behind and that communities are not being left behind. Um, one other key takeaway for me is uh, some of the the um, conversations we had about making this a very inclusive approach so that we have every voice at the table um, mm -hmm. and so that even on online partners we get their buy-in to make sure that we're building the carbon neutral future that we'd want to see um, happen years from now. Uh, so on behalf of the organizers of the Startup Energy Transition, I want to say thank you to all of you. I, I think this has been a great conversation. Um, and if you want to reach any of the panelists, please feel free to contact uh, the organizers of this uh, conference and they'll be able to put you in touch with them directly. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks a lot, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.